Well, hello, everybody. I hope you can uh, hear me wherever you are. I decided to focus today on <clears throat> only a handful of things that are of immediate relevance. There's a lot of uh, background research going on, which I've covered previously in different talks. <clears throat> I'll mention them uh, at the end, what's going on. <clears throat> but we'll try and focus on some exciting new developments that you should be able to benefit from quite shortly. So, you know, uh, you should know these slides. These are really just my warm up slides. Um, you know, our goal is to enable anybody to uh, sequence anything anywhere. <clears throat> and we've made fairly substantial progress towards that over the years. It's not quite there yet. Um, there's still a lot to do, but you can see that people are running the technology in lots of different places for a very broad number of applications. There's a portfolio of products now that are targeted at different uh, user types. And People are really running with the uh, anything anywhere concept, but there's a lot more to do. Now, if you're watching this and you don't know how nanopore sequencing works, I can't really help you with that in, in the time I've got, but there's a ton of information online and explanatory videos all about it. Um, one of the key features of the platform is that we, uh, I always talk about it, we sample molecules from liquid, from solution. And that changes the whole design of the product, really, and how it can be used and differentiates it from other platforms where they usually have to physically attach the molecules to the sensor. Uh, and as we'll see as the talk progresses, the fact that we can sample from solution gives us a number of key features and benefits that um, are quite revolutionary that we are now exploiting. The three major chunks to this. One, of course, the middle one here is nanopore data acquisition. That's the the device and the sensors and the chips and the pores and the bulk of the effort over the years has gone on building that and now more and more we're focusing on the software side that's the decoding and the downstream bioinformatics that's ramping up as you, you've seen and much more on the front end and one of our objectives on the front end is to simplify it and actually get rid of the lab as far as we can at the minute we're still very dependent on lab but you know, by changing the architecture of the device and the interaction with the sample, we can simplify that more and more. Now, again, just earlier today, my colleagues have spoken in depth about the uh, what you might call the continuous improvement side of our products. Uh, and Rosenberg has spoken specifically about uh, things which are coming, new kits, new products, timelines, features and costs. And Stuart's spoken about the um, where we are right now with things that you can run right now or very shortly. That should bring people up to speed. I'm going to focus more on, um, on near-term new things. That's what I tend to focus on. Uh, and that's what this talk will cover. Now, accuracy. So over the years, I've largely ignored this uh, topic because my experience has been that the more people bang on about it, the less they understand it. I mean, most of you who use the platform will know what I'm talking about. But today, in a break from that, I'm going to talk extensively about this, uh, this accuracy thing uh, and what we've been doing internally uh, more recently. So, um, <clears throat> as you know, um, our signal comes from ions moving through the pore, and we have to decode that in real time, and we use fairly sophisticated software to do that. Um, uh, we have a, a research effort in base calling, which pushes the front at the sort of frontier of that in terms of extracting information from the signal. And we've said it over the years that the signal is very rich, that intrinsically it carries a lot of information, given it's a single molecule readout and is running at very high speed. It, you know, it, it's all in there, but a, a lot of developments have gone into extracting the, the quality from that signal. Although intrinsically, it's very high fidelity. Um, and you've seen that uh, largely from software, not exclusively from software, I have to say, don't want to overplay, but there have been significant advances purely on the software side that have driven up the extraction of the value from that raw signal um, as shown in these graphs. And these are showing the sort of uh, past few years of development with uh, different um, software versions. And more recently, the Benito, which is the sort of cutting edge um, uh, piece of uh, base calling software that we use to uh, trial new methods in under a sort of open license. That's right at the cutting edge. 
And from 2012, we've moved from the old uh, HMM style based calling using different levels. That, all this was the subject of a legal dispute recently. We moved off that some time ago to using more modern uh, recurrent neural networks uh, that have uh, memory built in and what we call CTC style methods, which means that we can learn to label um, as we uh, process the signal. So from signal to answer, from end to end. And more recently, we've moved on to, um, we're moving on to what are called self, uh, self-supervised self methods. And we've built out the both the algorithms team and the uh, machine learning team. And there's a lot of significant developments going on there. It's just too much to talk about today. Um, it'll, we'll save it for another time, but th- there's still a lot of routes to go down in terms of extracting value from this signal. I'm going to talk about some of the latest stuff just now. Uh, <clears throat> so as I said, Benito is really where we tend to um, showcase the latest developments. Um, and uh, if you were to run that now, and if, as Stuart mentioned earlier, we've just integrated the Benito algorithms into, um, into Guppy, and they're going into Minnow very shortly. On the chemistry that you can run right now, this sort of baseline modal accuracy is around 98.3, 98.4%. And people have been able to replicate that performance um, in field. And on the bottom right-hand side of this slide, it's always good to look at pileups. You can see some of that data, which is uh, unfiltered. They've put no filter on every one of these slides because we don't cherry pick the reads. We align almost everything as you can see it. And you can see fairly substantial improvements there already on the baseline uh, chemistries. This is R9.4.1 here. We actually get better performance now across the board on R10. Um, And in principle, R10 should be better. And thanks to software developments, it is now substantially better. Now, the chemistry that's just coming out now, which has been in uh, in sort of uh, early release to our developer community, is what we're calling Q20 plus. And I've called it Q20 plus because again, we think with further iterations on software, it will improve more. Um, And this, as as the name suggests, gives a Q20 plus modal um, accuracy. You can see the graphs on the right hand side of this slide. A substantial fraction of reads above Q20, that's why it's Q20 plus. Again, I think it will shift to the right um, and it's highly performant on, that's performant by the way, it's a word, performant, just for the benefit of uh, cloth-eared lawyers at rivals, performant, um, that will improve further um, uh, as we tweak these methods. And currently we're focusing very much on improving homopolymer performance through R10. R10 is the pore that has a longer reader section. And again, R10 is now outperforming R9, I think, across the board. Um, and we're now getting, uh, again, modal 99.3 or a little bit higher on this chemistry. And the intention now is to uh, make this chemistry more broadly available. It has been tested by the sort of pioneering developer group and they've been showing or tweeting and hopefully they'll be publishing stuff on that soon. So they have been able to replicate that performance in field. Uh, So it all looks pretty solid. How we're gonna roll it out? Well, Rosemary's probably covered this in more detail, but um, the the key thing is it's, it's compatible with MinIron and GridIron right now. And you can register your interest to get the Q20 Plus kit today, as of today. And we anticipate to be shipping that for early access customers in June. And the main change there is there's actually some substantial changes to the, the kit uh, for that. One is uh, a fuel fix, which means that you don't need to top up fuel. We've tweaked the adapters quite substantially. So there's a much higher capture rate of molecules. There's been a change to the motor, the enzyme which I'll talk about more in later. And it is duplex capable. I'm gonna talk about what that means as well a little bit later. That's that's already baked in. And all the other ligation components are in that kit. So you need that kit really. That's the forwardly compatible kit that will cover much of what I'm gonna talk about today. The other thing that Rosemary's probably already mentioned, which I'll re-mention, is that we've made substantial progress in refining the electronics inside the Promethean box. That's the box itself. Um, and that has a substantial impact on the signal to noise on Promethean, pushing it really to state of the art, um, especially on, uh, on the new pores. And so we are upgrading Promethean boxes um, 
uh, right now and again or in July. And Rosemary's covered the mechanism by which people can get their prometheums upgraded uh, to really exploit the, the high quality base calling that we're now doing. Now this is this is let's talk about following on. <clears throat> Long story behind this. Um, back in 2012, when we first spoke about this technology, um, we spoke about sequencing one strand of the duplex molecule and sequencing the second strand of the duplex molecule. Uh, and I, I can't remember if we did a, a proof of concept on it. We probably did. We certainly spoke about it at a AGPT 2012. Um, and uh, <clears throat> obviously desirable to sequence both strands. It's quite useful to have both strands and you can combine them. You can jointly base call them. And uh, <clears throat> the story of Oxford Nanopore, if there's a story, it's really about circling back to something again and again and again until it finally works, usually after three iterations uh, and about seven years. So the original version we had of this was what's called 2D and some of you may remember that. And uh, you know, 2D had some good features, but um, it, again, it wasn't uh, that performant in field. The quality could be okay by the standards of the time, which are now horrifically out of date. Um, we worked on a version called 2DC. We did a synthetic complement on that. We never released that, similar to 2D. And then I, I ditched 2D largely because there were complications around uh, secondary structure forming on the trans side of the pore that would distort the signal and complicate the, the by the, the, at the time quite crude base calling couldn't deal with it uh, intelligently. There were some other artifacts caused by uh, the 2D. So we moved to a thing called 1D squared, uh, which I won't go into in detail, but um, <clears throat> we canned that as well. One of my courageous product decisions is to kill things I don't like. But anyway, some, some years ago, um, I dragged one of our research leaders into the office and um, I said, how often does the complement follow on the first strand anyway? Have we ever counted the follow-on rate? So they went off and looked at that. And it turns out that the second strand, without being attached to the first strand, will follow it through the hole somewhere between 1% and 4% anyway. So there's a natural way to get both strands of the molecule. Um, we just need to get the numbers up. And that's the basic approach we're now taking to sequencing both strands of the DNA. That's to get the complement to naturally follow on and optimize that so that we get both strands of the molecule. So <clears throat> here's how this works in the bottom right hand side, which I actually can't fully see because on my screen it's covered. I've got to do it from memory. But the first strand gets captured. You can see the strand going through there, you can see the tether on the membrane. And then when that's through, the second strand, the complement will follow it. And as a, uh, just as a, as a change of terminology here, I'm, I'm sick and tired of saying single pass, single molecule, you know, first strand and all this. Stuff. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna call, gonna call 1D, I'm gonna refer to it now as simplex. That's single pass, single molecule, single strand, the first strand. And where we get both strands and, and jointly base call them, I'm going to call that duplex. I'm going to call that duplex sequencing from now on. That's the new name for it. So you've got simplex and duplex. Just... And one of the key things with duplex is to make sure that there's a number of innovations here. Um, first of all, we have to get fully ligated symmetrical ends, so symmetrical Y adapters. We've modified the adapters on the ends, and we've made also a change to the motor. It's the E8.1 motor. And we have to heal any nicks that will terminate the translocation uh, prematurely. So I've been working on that. And without that, as I said, we get you know, between one, on a, a not optimized prep, you get a few percent of follow on. So just bear that in mind while I just skip along a little bit. So one of the innovations underpinning this duplex reading, and I, I mentioned this in previous talks, is we've been working on making sure that the sample only tethers to the membrane. In the old system, uh, the sample, apart from coating the inside of your pipette tip and whatever you've eppened off, it would go all over the flow cell where it has no chance of ever seeing a pore. And we've now got a system where we have uh, lock molecules that sit on the trans side of the pore that mean that the DNA only tethers on the, on the membrane, so where they can be reached by the pore. And that's about a 200 fold improvement in efficiency. And that means we can get higher sensitivity. We now get much higher sensitivity from this. And you can see from the picture here, the yellow stained DNA is 
is fluorescently labeled yellow. It's only on the membrane, the circular section, on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. And that, with the other innovations, gives us a large uplift in the duplex pairs that we can see on the trans tether system. So we're now routinely getting about 40% um, duplex pairs. And the highest we've seen in a crafty run is about 50%. And we're targeting with further optimization, getting to about 75% duplex follow on. So this is now quite significant. And you can see that the, um, from these graphs that we, later graphs actually, we see very consistent um, reading of both strands all the way through the run. It's very consistent, very clockwork reading. We don't see any significant tail offs or anything like that. Uh, so it, it's a nice natural, clockwork kind of architecture that sort of exploits what's happening anyway. So uh, from this, this is, in my brain anyway, a much nicer system than the ones we've attempted to roll out previously. Now, another innovation we've made to enable this is quite significant, and it's part of the, um, part of the Q20 Plus stuff, really, is that we've upgraded to this enzyme E8.1. And what that means is that it has substantially improved the movement quality on the complement strand. Now, in the old systems, apart from that secondary structure formation on the trans side, uh, we'd get a lot of skips and slips on the complement. And you can't take a good first strand and a crappy second strand and make a really good combination. You have to get both of them to be really good. And the complement quality we now see on this chemistry is almost the same on the, on the complement as it is on the first strand. So that's what's really paying off, that and software, obviously. We'll talk about that in a minute. So this is looking really quite good. Uh, now, um, <clears throat> the other side effects of these developments is that the amount we find it improves, this is, in my mind, again, a good indication that we've improved the architecture. We find that the duplex follow-on rate goes up as we put less DNA in. So again, that's what should happen in my mind. Uh, so, so again, this, is all very, this has all been very encouraging. This is all heading in the right direction. So it's much more sensitive. Now, here's two graphs. Now, most of the work on this has been done on a sort of standard library prep. And the graph here saying ligation is using our standard ligation prep kit. Um, and you can see we're getting reasonable rates of uh, a follow-on from a standard kit. And it actually goes up over time. And for Illumina users, uh, the uh, x-axis there is kilobases, not bases. So, so it's 60 kilobases, 80 kilobases, 100 kilobases. You know, so see, it actually performs very well with long fragments. There's no real degradation with fragment. In fact, if anything, it goes up. Um, and the right-hand side is more recent. We've only been working on ultralongs for a week or two. Um, but we still get a full-on with ultralong. And the key thing about that graph is, whilst it's not optimal, you see a consistent performance across the run time and a consistent performance with the fragment length. So there's no change there. And probably a lot of the low performance on the ultra long is down to efficient ligation of symmetrical ends on very long fragments. And that's the problem that we need to solve there. And given that a lot of the ultra long work has been done outside of Nanopore by academic groups and by uh, at least two private companies I'm aware of, you know, it would be good to work with those companies to improve the efficiency of the double Y adaption on ultra long fragments. I mean, we'll crack it anyway eventually, but it's an open field just to get the ultra longs to be following on at the same kind of 30 to 60% that we see on the standard kits. The longest duplex pair to date is, and that's obscured on my slide, I can't see it, but I think it was 130 KB. I actually can't see on my slides here, working from memory. Uh, Maybe it's 400, I can't remember, it's one of those, it's one of those two. But we, we see, you know, there's no degradation with fragment length, as long as you've got both ends on. So this looks pretty good to me. Uh, now, what happens when we base call them? And here's the money shot, really. So um, some time back, we funded um, Ian Holmes and Geordie Sylvester Ryan at Berkeley to develop a joint decoder of the signal from first strand and second strand. And a derivative of that has been implemented in the latest Benito. And that Benito is now actually on GitHub. So it's already fully enabled to do duplex decoding. 
And we're now getting, uh, I'm not sure if this is R10 or R9, I suspect it's R10. We're touching a Q30 modal duplex decode accuracy with a, you know, a substantial fraction, maybe a third of the reads being well above Q30 and almost all the reads being well above Q20. Uh, so that is um, now uh, uh, overlapping or engulfing the other long read platform and overlapping and pushing on the market leading short read platform. The key point there is this is from two copies, two different copies. It's not from 30 copies like the other long read platform. It's not from a thousand copies like the other short read platform. It's from two copies. We're getting approximately Q30 accuracy. So that reinforces the point, what, partly why I've ignored the accuracy stuff, that the intrinsic quality of the data on this platform is extremely high. And we're now able to realize that through, um, through tweaks and software. Everybody feels that these graphs are going to shift to the right with further effort. These are, you know, these are beta graphs I'm showing beta quality software, and we think it will improve with more effort on the software side. There are some chemistry tweaks we've been playing with recently that are also pushing these numbers up that look quite exciting. Now, the other key point here, another key differentiator from the other platforms is to look at the graph on the left. And what you've got there is the length of the duplex read. And on the y-axis, you've got the quality. And you can see it's almost normally distributed uh, regardless of the length. In other words, there's no degradation of the quality with length. So uh, the longest duplex Q30 read to date is 156 KB. And that's of a standard ligation prep. So 156 KB read at approximately Q30 accuracy. So very long reads, very high quality. And the bioinformatics group, um, again, on the platforms, you don't have that because you've got to fit the circular templates into a hole. You have to compromise the length. So that, 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 we don't have anything like that on this platform. Now, the, the bioinformatics group have made a little pileup here. Always good to look at pileups. And again, this is very nascent new stuff. Um, you know, looking at Q30 reads is always nice in a pileup because it looks nice and clean. And we're able to see somatic low frequency variant calling of very high quality on these data. So, my prediction would be that, you know, if we, when that comes out very shortly, that should significantly boost a lot of the work people are doing on assembly and, uh, and variant detection. So this is quite exciting for us to hit this, but it was always there. Now, they've given me this slide, it's a bit cheeky. Um, I don't like comparative marketing, especially negative comparative marketing, but I think it's worth making this point. You've got A and B here, two pileups. One is these uh, Q30 duplex reads, and one is a rival long read platform. And the point is that we can't see any substantial difference between their high quality multi-copy reads and our duplex reads. So this is really now nudging at um, some of the claims that have been made around quality from other platforms. And again, I think we're going to overtake over the coming months quite easily those other platforms. And because we're, we're using two copies rather than 30, of course, you don't have the concomitant loss of throughput and you don't have the concomitant increase in price and cost. Great, so that, that is really the, the main message I wanted to get over today. And um, because those kits are going out and the software is already out, you should, you know, certainly early access customers and developers should be able to run this within a month or two. So we're anticipating quite an aggressive launch of duplex capability over the summer. So again, going back to 2012, um, <clears throat> you know, we explained about this sampling from solution business and how it changes all of the dynamics of the platform. And um, <clears throat> one of the old stories here is that without the motor, DNA will zip through the duplex DNA. It strips off one strand and it will zip through at a tremendous speed. And actually, it's an old idea. Um, there's an old, um, old paper we dug out here from Dima Branton Kasyanovich showing the relationship between the time taken for the molecule to go through the pore and the size of the molecule. And obviously, you'd expect that to correlate, and it does. Obviously, it's an old factoid, and uh, the unzip speed and the fragment size are directly related. So you can make a graph of fragment size versus speed to go through. That's all fine. That's without a motor. Okay, so that's been sort of hanging in the air for many years. Um, 
Now, <clears throat> there, are, there are two ways to put DNA through a pore. And again, we spoke about these in 2012. On the, bottom, on the bottom right here, that's shown. The method that you're using right now, we've called INI. And I, I chose that, again, for architectural reasons. But there we catch the end of the DNA. The motor is on the front. It's on the proximal part of the DNA. And then the motor breaks the DNA as it goes through the pore into the other side. And a long story behind why I chose that. But the, the other way to do it, which is probably more prevalent in academic work, is to have the motor on the back end of the DNA, the distal end, unzip the DNA, catch the motor, and then let the motor pull the DNA out of the pore. And you can do both of those, either five prime end down or three prime end down, which again opens up possibilities with regards to reading DNA in both directions. We, we, again, we never exploited that yet. We'll, we'll, circle, we'll circle back to that one at some point, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> so that's any and that's outy. And so we decided some while back, about a year ago, to start looking at outy again. And again, it's for arch what I would call architectural reasons. Here's an outy sequencing mode. And the left-hand panel shows the capture of the DNA. You've got that naked uh, proximal end now. And here the DNA is on the distal end. So we unzip the DNA through the pore. And that's the white panel. Then what happens is the motor destalls and jams on the pore top. Okay, and then after a pause, it will start to consume ATP and motor, and then it will drag the DNA out of the pore. And not shown here, unfortunately, is actually when it gets to the end of the DNA, it will just stop and sit there. It's not shown here. It's, there's a sort of missing panel. Uh, but then what you can do is you have to decide to eject the molecule, right? So you can kick it out. That's architecturally very different from the INI method where we just zip through and it's just constantly streaming. And one of the reasons I didn't pursue this early on is because there's quite a lot of complicated software control required here that we didn't have in the old days, but, but now we have it. And if you look at the signal on the bottom here, you can see the gray panel. There's a gray section of the signal on the bottom left. And that's the unzipping step. And there you can see the strand unzipping and you can time how long it takes the strand to unzip into the stalled position. And then in the white panel, the white section, you can see the stall. And then the motor unstalls and the green section, you can see the motoring. You can see the actual reading of the DNA. <clears throat> so the point here is from the length of that gray section, we know how long the molecule is before we decide to sequence it. And using the uh, read until stroke adaptive sampling stuff, we can then decide to eject a molecule based on its length. So if it's too short, we can kick it out. Now, if you look at the length of time spent sequencing, it, it's hundreds of seconds, or for a long molecule, it can be minutes, even hours for megabase. Uh, size molecules, but the time taken to size it is a few seconds, which means that we can look at a molecule, kick it out, look at another one, kick it out. We can go through 10, 15, 20 molecules before we find one that's long enough. And then we can spend minutes sequencing it. So it's quite efficient to adaptively sample the length of the molecule. What that means is with a given input fragment distribution, let's say 10% of them are above 300 KB, it's quite efficient to look at 10, 15, 20 molecules to find one that's above 300 KB and then spend 15 minutes sequencing it. So what this opens up architecturally is the ability to uh, size select fragments at runtime in real time on the platform. And that's a key new feature that we're gonna be introducing over the summer. At the moment, the accuracy on this chemistry is not phenomenally good. If I'd shown this two, three years ago, we'd have been quite happy with it. But compared to the current chemistry, it's lagging. The main reason for that, it's not optimized. The main reason is that the pores we're using have been tuned up for the INI reading, where the DNA is facing the other way around. So there's quite a big search going on now for pore mutants that improve the signal to noise. The signal to noise on this is about 80% of what it is on the INI system. 
But once we've got that, we'll push the numbers up and it will be performant, performant a &T, uh, on the accuracy side. So that, that's work in progress, but it basically works. It's not, not, it'll get there. I'm quite happy with that for now. Um, <clears throat> now what this opens up then, this is just showing in more detail what's going on. Um, <clears throat> you can see here on, on the right-hand side, we catch a read <clears throat> and then uh, we get to the end. And another feature here of this architectural feature is that when we get to the end, I mentioned it, it pauses, it, the whole complex will just sit there. It will actually hold the DNA, the one you've just sequenced, and the motor it will hold. And the reason for that is the motor is actually clipped on. It's actually wrapped around the strand. It can't come off, but it can let go. It can let go without coming off. And after some time period, lots of factors there, it will let go. And what happens then is the strand will slip back down into the pore. And at some point, the motor will grab onto it again. And then it will start sequencing again. And it will go around that loop indefinitely, indefinitely. And the signal from the first read is the same. It's got the same characteristics as the signal from the second read or the third read or the fourth read or the fifth read or the 1,000th read. So we can reread a fragment, at certainly the end of it, and at the moment it's between 2 and 10 KB. We can reread a fragment now indefinitely in a loop. And when we feel we've collected enough data from that, we can eject the fragment and catch another fragment. And this is a concept we're calling adaptive accuracy, because what you can do, and of course, is you can be base calling that as you go, and you can base call it to a point where you're happy with the accuracy, the combined accuracy, and then you can move on to a different fragment. Now, uh, work's been done in the algorithms group here <clears throat> to make a joint, we call it a joint signal base caller for this purpose. So given signal from the same piece of DNA at high coverage, we can now jointly decode that. It's a kind of what you might think of as a kind of signal space Madaka. And that's also there. So this all looks very exciting. Um, we'd like to increase the distance of dropback. I'd like to get much further than 10 KB. I'd like to get sort of 20, 30 KB. But here's a way to garner more and more accuracy on a molecule. Even at this early stage, we're getting rereads here, which are perfect, even with the, the lower numbers that we saw earlier on this chemistry. So again, this looks like it's got long legs. Uh, and as you know, that uh, you know, ultralongs work, and we're trying to focus more and more on shifting these developments onto ultralongs. The longest reads that have been seen are in the megabase range, and I'd like to get everything up into that range, ideally. Uh, and you've already seen already, and this is now out in field. Uh, years ago, we provided an API that lets you adaptively sample from those liquid molecules. So you, you can get a molecule, you can sequence the first section, and you can say, is it in my region of interest? Yes or no. And if not, you can kick it out and catch another one. And the, the API for that is quite mature. And other people in academia have written software that exploits that API to do targeted sequencing without having to manipulate the sample. That's a kind of software targeting. So bear that in mind, we call that adaptive sampling. It used to be called read until. Another important feature. I'm recapping on these features because they're somewhat synergistic, as I'll come on to later. Now there's another way to do size selection on the platform, uh, which may be of more immediate interest than the outie method. It turns out we can do it with the inny method. And here's the scheme for that one. So here, uh, it's conventional any chemistry. So that's all there. It's the same motor, it's the same pore, it's the same base caller. We know that's all good. What we do here is we ligate a hairpin. Yes, we ligate a hairpin onto one end of the molecule. But we've moved the motor from the uh, proximal end onto the hairpin end. So what happens here is in the any scheme, we unzip the DNA until it jams and destalls the motor, gives the motor a kick. And then the motor does a completely conventional any motor, as if it was on, the, on a single stranded piece of DNA, a complement. So again, from the inward unzip, we don't sequence that, we only get the size estimation from that. 
we get the sequence only from the complement. But it's the same basic idea. We can still size the fragment before we decide to sequence it, and we can kick it out if it's too short. And because that's all in E, it's the Q20 plus chemistry straight away, straight out of the box. So on paper, you might think that looks nice. Um, I don't think it's architecturally as good as the Audi, but the Audi has more work to do in terms of making it optimal. It's certainly more immediate, I think, is it? You know, most of the bits are there. And here's a, it's a quick example of that. <clears throat> here's a thing that matters here really is a, is a proof of concept slide. Here's the bottom right, the unsized selected data is the gray distribution. And we've done a quick size selection at 50 KB. And you can see that we can shift the, uh, the fragment distribution up to the right, basically. We can size select upwards and select out longer molecules. Now there's still quite a bit of spread on that. There's still shorter molecules in there. A lot of that software related, it's, you know, it's quite new software to control this, other factors as well to do with the real-time control or needs sharpening. I think it is mostly software, uh, but clearly we can size select on platform with the uh, INI method right now. Uh, yeah. And we can do it with the Audi method. The Audi method doesn't look as impressive. Again, that's mostly because all of our real-time control software has been tuned up for INI. We've only just been trying to warp it to Audi and there's lots of changes. So whilst you're kind of working on IoT, I think that will improve dramatically with further optimization. But they both basically work. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means lots of things, and you can speculate. What I like about it is the potential here for what I'm calling adaptive finishing. And for those of you who are long in the tooth on DNA sequencing like me, you'll know what finishing means. It's an old concept. So in the early days of genome sequencing, you would smash things up, and you, or you could clonally, you'd clone bits of DNA you try and make assemblies and you find that you'd miss bits. You'd find there are gaps or things are misordered. So you then have to go back and do targeted cloning typically to try and bridge the gaps and span the bits of the genome that you're getting wrong. That's the basic idea behind finishing. Well, if you do the thought experiment here, you can do a, a long read genome with these high quality reads. You can do it um, with ultra longs. You can build an assembly and then you've got assembly ambiguities. You've got a, a variety of contigs that fit between other contigs where the joins are ambiguous. Well, the idea here is that you could then, you could certainly, using adaptive sampling, you could say, well, I want to find reads that start in contig A. I just want reads in contig A. But they need to be long enough to span the ambiguous section. So you can imagine a modified version of adaptive sampling where apart from the targeting region, you can now specify a length cutoff. So you want everything longer than 300 KB on the assumption that will span the ambiguous parts of your, your assembly. And then you can close the assembly because you can go back to the same sample. Remember, you can run a, a nanopore flow cell. You can get the data. You can assemble it. You can take the flow cell off the device and park it in the fridge. And then you can come back to it at, at a future date with an adaptive sampling table and resample longer fragments from the same input. It won't go anywhere you can rerun it. And if you want to be really crafty, you could actually be building your assembly graph and altering the adaptive sampling and the adaptive fragment selection. You could do it in real time, I think it's not very fancy, but the simpler idea is to go back and do a finishing step later on with the same sample. And so we can then think about actually doing targeted sequencing in both uh, region and length. And I think that will come. We haven't done that yet, but it's the next step, obviously, applying these methods. So here's my conjecture. And this is a key thing. If the input fragment size distribution is long enough, that's the key thing. And again, a lot of work's been done on that by academia and third party companies. You can, if you can adaptively select a target region or a contig, and we can do that. People have shown that outside. You can now adaptively select the length of the target molecules and then a final tweak to that would be to be able to adaptively target haplotypes. Now, again, I haven't seen this yet, but I'm pretty confident it's possible is that from the first 400 bases, 1,000 bases, from the, uh, the, the patterns of correlated mutations you see along that, haplotypes or polytypes, or even base modifications, 
you should be able to determine which chromosome the fragments come from. So you should be able to decide, well, do I want more fragments from this chromosome with this, that has the same haplotype, or do I want more fragments from a different chromosome that have somewhat different haplotypes? Now, certainly the first two, and possibly the third one, my bet would be, if you can do that, which we can, we can do in principle, any genome can be assembled and closed. That's my conjecture. And that remains to be proved or disproved. And the point of that is obviously, in my opinion, that's, you can do nanopore only genomes with the, the, <coughs> with the developments I've just shown today. So that's great news. That will prove out, I think, over the coming months. All right, so that's the two, big, the two biggies. Um, let's talk about some other things that have been covered already, just very briefly. I think these are significant. So I think James Clark's already spoken about Flongal. Stick with Flongal. We have quite a few Flongal users, Flongal fans. Stick with it. Um, it's been used actually now as a, as a test platform for the next generation of chips. And what we've done now is we have now proof concept and we're moving towards this of building non-silicon fab based, plasticky, cheap, floppy Flongal flow cells. Uh, and why is that good? Well, it's scalable manufacture. It's much cheaper. That means we can look at the pricing on Flongal and bring it down. And just much better. Actually, the performance is better. We're getting now better data quality, better signal to noise out of these new Flongal chips that we're going to be rolling out at some point. One of the key changes there is we're moving back to a silver chloride based chemistry. Again, we get, we're getting higher performance out of that. That means longer run times for Flongal. And it means that we can get rid of some of the faff that's around the current flow cells where you have to flush things and prime them. And we, again, as I mentioned, I started this talk by saying there's work to do in getting rid of the lab. Well, getting rid of the pipette, we, we need a just add sample flow cell. And that's going to come first on Flongal. And here it is, all looking very good. <clears throat> now, what I'm not talking about today, but I've mentioned previously, is integrating the sample prep with these just add sample flow cells. Um, I'm going to save that for the future, but there's a lot of investment gone into that, and I've shown it on Minan and Flongal. Um, and the, the, uh, the, the current thing there is we've been developing electronic sample preps that are miniaturized, where you can just put a swab in, say a swab input, uh, lye cells, and do all the prep on the flow cell. That's coming along quite nicely. It's too early to show today. But if you take the developments I'm showing here and you combine it with the developments I'm showing there, all you should need for a lot of applications is just a swab. Right? So that's quite, quite key for us. It's a long time coming, but it is getting there. Now, I, here are some products I mentioned previously that are, <clears throat> about two years ago, I, I somewhat pushed these onto the back burner to focus really on getting the current products, particularly Promethion and Flongal, really up to scratch. So um, a little bit delayed, these things. But another key factor there is they all require a new ASIC. And we've been working on a new ASIC, shown at the bottom. It's completely designed by Nanopore. And apart from its two key features are, it's much lower power requirement. So it's more friendly for battery operation. And um, it's much cheaper. <clears throat> and that means it can be fully disposable. And again, all these products really rely on that to make them cost effective. Uh, and we have that now in-house, it's under test, and we'll be showing data from that later in the year. So for example, the, the Minar Mark II design on the bottom left here, the black part is non-disposable, but the blue part is disposable. Uh, and that's going right back to the original 2012 concept in, some, in many ways. <clears throat> Smidge Iron, again, same again, a very cheap uh, flow cell. Th there's no point having a device like Smidge Iron if you require a vortexer a Gilson rack and a box of tips, absolutely pointless. That has to have a swab input to be viable. Uh, the uh, Plongal is in design phase and that has a parallel set of these new ASICs embedded in a plate format sequencer, all under development. So um, <clears throat> you know, those will come, but there are critical, uh, critical things on the roadmap that have to happen first. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of work's now gone into Promethion. And we've shown 10 terabase outputs per Promethean run, 72 hours. Uh, and the, the biggest customer yield per flow cell is at 242 gigabases per flow cell. And 
<clears throat> that's still only using about 60% of what's possible. Uh, and we, you know, we're still further optimizing these things by having more pores and less blocking typically. Um, so this really is, I, I think this is the highest performance, performance ANCE, highest performance sequencer um, out there right now. And uh, that lab with 80 of them will be by far the world's largest DNA sequencing throughput facility by far. And of course, anybody who's run, I've built these before, high throughput facilities, a lot of it's about the front end automation. So a lot of effort's gone into building out robotics at the front and parallel sample handling to feed these things for sample optimized workflows, where the workflows are generally quite homogenous, human genomes, for example, at a certain coverage level. That's all now looking pretty good. And again, the key thing here is we've dramatically improved the electronics inside the box. So the performance of Promethean in terms of signal to noise uh, should now outstrip uh, most of the other devices going forwards. Now, here's a new product I'm going to get out. So having said that here's all the other products, which are somewhat on the back burner, I've decided to slip in a new product. And we're calling it, uh, it's got two formats. We're calling it the P2. How can I do this? Well, <clears throat> the fact is it doesn't use any new bits. It's using bits that we already, we already use elsewhere. It's a reformatting. It's not dependent on new ASICs or anything. So <clears throat> here it is. This is the, an outline specification. Um, it's, it's a small box. Um, this, is the, this is the integrated version. It has everything in it. Switch it on, computer, GPU, off you go. It runs two uh, Promethean flow cells. And there are, will there'll be two formats of this flow cell I'll talk about in a minute. It's called a P2. Um, pricing is very provisional. Obviously, it's going to be competitive. I'm hoping we can sell much smaller, more granule flow cell packs for this than the large high discount flow cell packs we sell for Promethean. I suspect that will probably mean the flow cells will for this will only be usable on this device. We'll see about that. Uh, now we think we can show this, we're gonna be showing it hopefully at NCM later in the year, and we're targeting Q1 next year for early access. Uh, why do this? Well, um, uh, because two, two Promethean flow cells at 200G to 300G, that kind of range. Uh, that keeps it well ahead of the other long read sequencer and the other mid range short read sequences in terms of flexibility, certainly cost and performance, especially when you factor in the targeted sequencing, the size selection and the duplex reads, it just keeps a step ahead. But there's another format we're gonna make for this and that's shown on the bottom left here is the circular thing. And this, this has no computing in it, well, very little computing in it. It's really uh, a bit like MinIron. It's got some support firmware. Again, two flow cells, <clears throat> and it's cabled into another box, like the MinIron Mark 1B. Um, <clears throat> and I've shown it here deliberately plugged into a gridiron, because this is, I see it as an expansion pack for gridiron. And again, it just keeps gridiron users ahead. Uh, gridiron will then be able to, well, the latest version of gridiron, uh, which has all the relevant computing and GPU in it, can then run minine flow cells, it can run flongal flow cells, it'll be able to run the new flongal flow cells, and it can run two Promethean flow cells. Um, and there'll be in another format here, apart from the single channel Promethean flow cells, which is quite good for barcoded stuff, we're going to bring back the four channel Promethean flow cells, so you can have eight different things going on in parallel on two flow cells. And again, P2 Solo um, is an upgrade to Gridiron. It just keeps you ahead, especially when you roll in the accuracy improvements, the duplex reads, the size selection. Uh, so if you've, our philosophy has always been, if you've made that investment in Nanoport, we will keep you ahead by upgrading, whether it's uh, chemistry, firmware, software, or add-ons. And you can register your interest for both these products right now. So right now, if you're on the old stuff, what I consider to be the old stuff, the stuff that's mature, um, you'll be on like 98.4, but the latest Q20 plus chemistry is now typically above 99%. The duplex is touching Q30, it's gonna improve. Um, it's pretty efficient at 40%. Probably by the time you're running it, it'll be above that. 
Um, the applications group have shown now state-of-the-art um, SNP detection and SV detection. That's, I don't talk about that too much. Uh, assemblies are going to get much better with these new data I've spoke about today. Um, and I haven't had time to cover it. Of course, we can do methyl, denosine, um, 5MC and 5-hydroxy. So we're doing pretty well on modification detection. And again, there's a huge amount of work going on. I'm not talking about on incorporating direct calling of modifications in the base caller from natural DNA. That's for a different time. Uh, <clears throat> the read length records, you know those, they're quite widely publicized in the megabase ranges. I would like to get size selection to be doing megabase size selection. That's my ambition. And then our, our longest uh, Q30 read is 156 kilobases. So it's, it's all now looking pretty good. There's some things I haven't spoken about today. I mentioned one is the integrated sample prep on the flow cell. Um, <clears throat> we're doing a lot of work on um, my much maligned, but really I think quite good idea for writing information on natural DNA. That's going on in the background. Um, and probably, probably more broadly significant for people is we're investing very substantially in taking a soup of natural proteins and being able to sequence the proteins on existing nanopore hardware. So again, we'll save that for the future. It's not immediate, not that's immediately relevant to anybody. What I've shown today is immediately relevant, i.e. within the next six months or so. Now I'm just moving on. <clears throat> we announced a while back uh, a new project we're supporting called All.1. And um, <clears throat> the goal here is for us to support and enable uh, the sequencing of critically endangered, well, the effectively generation of reference, you know, quote unquote reference, you know, if there is such a thing, of critically endangered species. And the main objective there is to help conservationists um, get to grips with what's going on with these uh, animals. We're also pushing to, we're given we're giving free flow cells for this. We're also pushing to um, enable scientists in the country where these animals live to do the actual work, that is to own the biology and generate the data and get the credit for it and have a hand in what happens next. Rather than, frankly, the situation where gravitational pull means that samples get slurped off to wealthy countries that have arrays of expensive instruments uh, where they get sequenced and there's a lot of high-fiving goes on. We're trying to somewhat break that model. Um, we're not managing it directly. It's a ground up, it's an organized chaos project. It's really throw things out there and see what happens. We're encouraging a kind of self-organizing principle. We're encouraging people to uh, collaborate with each other and as far as possible, where it's allowable legally and ethically, to share their data as soon as possible. And of course, all that data will be, if it's shared, will be combinable with other people's projects. There is inevitably overlap with some other projects that are similar to this one. Can't avoid that, so it's gonna be the same animals in some respects. Um, but we're not running it as such, we're not organizing it, we're not controlling it in any sense. Uh, at the moment, it's in pilot phase. Uh, and the pilot phase will sh shake down any issues and we'll learn a lot from it. Now, what do we get from it? Well, you know, our, our ambition is to enable anybody to sequence anything anywhere. That's what we get from it. Uh, this is, is hard. I mean, these, some of these animals are quite difficult to sequence. There's a lot of unknowns. Um, and it will shake down the technology and it will force us to fix things. And I'm hoping that the improvements I've shown today, when applied to this project, will really make the... Um, ability to sequence these animals much, much easier. Uh, so it's so a really, in a way, from my point of view, this project can be a test bed for all the latest nanopore technology as well. And it helps us develop it. So that is all dot one. Uh, and you know, it's, it's been written up. Uh, there are some very simple rules. Again, a very ground and bottom up process, not top down. Please do check that out and have a go if you're interested. And, uh, and that's the end of my uh, update today. I hope that's been informative. Thank you very much.